Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Everybody doing all right? Good to see you all out there. Hey, I just want to take a moment. We're going to jump in. I'm really excited about what we're going to be uh, unpacking today. Uh, but I want to take a moment, obviously, with uh, Veterans Weekend, I want to take a moment to acknowledge those who've served. If, you, if you've served in our, our military, will you stand for a moment? We can just acknowledge you in, in the room today. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I say that because I think it's important for us to recognize uh, that, that coming back. I got lots of friends that have served the military. I'm sure you have too, or at least family members or current friends. I was hanging out with one the other day and just talking about just the struggles of, on this side of life and the reality of that. And I've spoke with so many families that are saying, man, every year, and it's not just that time of year, but every year when that weekend rolls around also just uh, reminds us of even just mentally, emotionally, uh, you know, physically, kind of the ramifications of having to go into war and battle. And I think it's important. We believe in healing. Uh, we believe that Jesus heals. And we believe that, that even you coming here can be a place of healing. So I want to pray into to healing um, and want you guys to join me as we jump into the word this morning. So Jesus, we start this morning recognizing you're the God of healing. And you are the God of comfort. And Jesus, as we even recognize those who served, we know that that came and comes with a lot of sacrifice on the individual, but also on families and communities. And uh, we know just the ripple effect that, that comes back home. And I pray for everyone that's here or family members that are represented um, that aren't here. We do pray that you continue to bring healing and wholeness mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, in all those ways. Jesus, may you just again be the God of all comfort. Uh, Jesus, even as we jump in this morning, uh, I pray that you would open our eyes to see as we talk about discernment and discerning the days that we're in, I pray, Spirit of truth, Holy Spirit, you are the Spirit of truth. Would you come now and would you speak truth? Would you allow the words of Scripture that you inspired, which are truth, to speak to us? Open our eyes, open our hearts, open our ears to receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I wanted to just kind of say this week is a, a continuation off of last week. Uh, and so I'm not going to go back and hit a lot of those things, but if there's some context, you can go back online and listen if you missed it. Uh, but today we're going to talk about this idea of how do you discern spiritually and discerning just in your personal life, but even spiritually discerning the days that we're living in. And we've been saying this, that this is like year three, talking about being disciples. And maybe you don't use that word disciple, but everybody in the room right now, you are a disciple. You are a follower of something. So if, even if you're here and you're 10, 8, seven years old, all the way up to eight, seven with a zero, anywhere in there, a whole spectrum of every age in the room, you are a disciple of something. It could be a person, an ideology, philosophy, a, a religion, whatever. You are all shaped and formed. And you might not use the word disciple, but you are being influenced and absorbing whatever has the weight into your life. And all of us we are all sponges absorbing things from everywhere. I mean, just think about this. Last week, I was, you, can, you can look on your phone, by the way, and this could be super encouraging um, or discouraging for some of us. You can look and go, oh my goodness, I've been that many hours this week on my screen. Like, I had that many hours on that many apps, and it will tell you all that. Don't look at it, because you'll be like, oh my goodness. I can't believe I spend that much time on that. But how many of you know that like, whatever that we subject ourselves to has the power to influence us? How many of you know that, right? So whether it's something that you're screened, friends have the power to influence you. Educators, bosses, coaches, coworkers, neighbors, family members, anybody has the power to influence you. And you start thinking about how much information we absorb from all different sources of media, movies, culture, just driving our car down the road, things we see on billboards, uh, conversations that we're having with people that we hang out with, all of those things influence us, and we're all disciples, and we're shaped by those things. So look at the person next to you and say, you're a disciple. Yes, you are a disciple, and, and maybe you're being a disciple for good things. Maybe, maybe not. And here's the interesting thing is that my hope today, and this is a continuation of last week, is to help us maybe understand how significantly the days of deception that we're living in today. Now, some of you might be like, I don't know what you're talking about. We'll get to that. And, and sure, there's a little bit of a context because maybe for some of us you can contrast that. When I say days of deception, 
Are you saying in comparison to other days? And, and are those days not, dece- like, what does that all mean, days of deception? And I want to help us navigate it. And I, I was hesitant to share this, but there's no reason I shouldn't. It's just, it takes a lot of time. But I really felt several years ago, probably around 2017, I heard, I heard in my heart, and it was a theme over and over again. I've shared this with you. The Lord said, prepare, 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 prepare. Uh, and not prepare like panic, run to the hills, live in a bunker kind of prepare. Well, that's fun, cool, if you want to do that. But more the preparing spiritually for the days that we're in. And I really believe in, in, and we're going to hit this here in a second, but I believe that we're living in days of deception, and I really feel it's, it's part of my job as a pastor, and all pastors, and it's part of all of our jobs, is to walk in the truth, walk in the light, and, and be prepared that we aren't deceived. Because there's something about, like, have you ever had somebody deceive you before? Lie to you, steal your, steal your credit card information. How many of you have ever had that happen, right? Total scammer, you know, and I wish, because, like, I get on my phone now, it'll say, like, warnings. If a number comes up, sometimes it'll say, like, telemarketer or something like that. Wouldn't it be awesome if, like, any time Satan and the enemy came with deception, you had a notification on your phone? Wouldn't that be great? Like, don't listen, deceiver. That would be awesome. Like, I mean, no, it's listening to your conversation anyways, okay? Now, if it just told us back, hey, that's a deception, that's a lie. And here's the passage of Scripture. I just want to get us in the Word quick. All, I'm going to spend most of our time looking in Timothy. We're, we're kind of going through Timothy here because it's so critical if we're talking about disciples. Jesus created distinctions and lines, and our culture wants to blur the lines. But Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. And Jesus created a lot of lines. That's not like in vogue today. Today is like, no, there should be nuance. <laughs> like, no, there's a line. <laughs> he says, you're with me or you're not. And I think it's actually, hell. I actually think we deep inside crave clarity. I think in a world of chaos and confusion, we'd rather someone just say, it is this way, it's not this way. And, and we want to muddy it, we want to like, well, but what about, what about, what about, I understand there's places for that, don't get me wrong. But I think when it comes to the truth and being able to discern the truth, it's important for us to hear from God's word and the spirit of truth to give us clarity in days of confusion and certainly days of, of deception. So here's the passage that we're in. Um, I'm going to bounce around Timothy because it's a theme. I'm pulling themes out of Timothy, so we're going to hang out, but I'm going to have you like move around in different chapters. But Timothy, the reason that this came up is because Paul, who's writing the letter, that's why it's called Timothy 1 or Timothy 2. It's two letters. It was just a letter that, that the Spirit of God inspired Paul to write Timothy and then is in our scriptures, became scripture for us in the Bible. But what was happening was Timothy had a church, and as a result of all kinds of pagan, false teachings, false prophets, they were coming into the church, causing a lot of confusion and a lot of deception. And so this was what was happening. And as a result of that deception, many were leaving the faith. And and so when Paul writes to Timothy, he addresses it for them at that time, but the word he gives them is timeless for all of us today. He actually speaks to the moment Back then, but he speaks to the future where we're at today. So we can take what he said and apply it. It's relevant today. That's my point. So 1 Timothy 4, this is what he says. The Spirit, capital S here, the Holy Spirit, Spirit of Truth. The Spirit clearly, everybody say clear. Without confusion, the Holy Spirit clearly says, like, don't miss this. It's not meant to be muddled. It's not like the Holy Spirit's hinting. It clearly, he clearly says, the Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, and we've been saying this for a few weeks, but in case you missed it, the latter days, the latter times, the last days in Scripture started, imagine bookends, started when Jesus ascended to heaven 2,000 years ago. That started this phrase called the latter times or the last days. And, and then it's completed, the other book in, with the arrival of Jesus. And so when you look at those two, the first coming of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, kind of the bookends. And then as we get closer, so we're, we've been in the latter days, the latter times, since Jesus ascended. But also there's the last or the latter part of the latter days. That means that as we get closer to the second coming of Jesus, that we're going to notice things. And, and the word is so clear, Jesus was so good, and the New Testament writers to say, listen, pay attention, because as we get closer in the latter days of the latter days, there will be things that allows us to kind of go, huh, Jesus said he's coming back, 
And there's going to be warning signs. There's going to be things that, that we can pay attention to. Just like Jesus would oftentimes use the example of agriculture or nature. Like, oh, I can see over the horizon a storm coming. I can read that. I can go, hmm, there's a sign in the nature that's saying rain is probably coming. Or you can look at just the leaves on the trees. How many of you have been driving around and you know we're in fall? How many of you know we're in fall? Yeah. You know we're in fall. And you could see it coming without even a calendar. You, you can just see the leaves on the trees changing. You know what that means. Jesus alluded to things in the natural that we can understand in the supernatural or in the spiritual. And he would say as we get closer to the return of Jesus, which we don't know how close we are, but certainly he did say that things begin to intensify the closer. One of the things, and I don't have time because a lot of people focus on uh, current events, and, and there's a place for that. I just don't have time to do that. But that's, that's one way of looking at reading the signs of the time. What I want to focus on is what I actually think is more critical, which is that as we get closer, there's, there's an increase of deceiving spirits. And I think like, that's really important for us to like, just pay attention to that because no matter where we're on the timeline with the coming of Jesus, it's always important to understand and have our discernment. The Bible says that you can walk in the powers of discernment. Like, and we'll define discernment in a moment, but this is what he says here. Let me just keep reading that Timothy passage. The Spirit clearly says that in the latter time, some will abandon the faith. Some will actually turn. Now, I want to be really clear. First service, and I want to make myself very, very clear. When we talk about those who are turning from their faith, and by the way, Jesus referenced this also. Paul referenced this also in another book in Thessalonians. That as we get closer to Jesus, there will be those, it's called the apostasy, the falling away, those that are deceived, and they actually turn against Jesus. Now, now what we're talking about here is how does someone move from an all-in believing faith to an all-out leaving faith? Now, I, what I'm not talking, I want to be really clear on this, is not saying if you have doubts. That's not what I'm saying at all. In fact, I'm a big proponent that I think doubts are part of nor normal, like searching and hunger and thirsting. So I did this first service, and I want to do this again. How many of you have doubts? I have doubts. It's okay. There's things we doubt. Like, I don't, I don't know about that. God, I, so we want you to know, like, you have permission. I think church should be the best place for doubts. I think church should be, like, Jesus wasn't intimidated when people came and said, hey, I have some doubts. Jesus is like, I, I know. You, you, here, let me show you some things. Jesus was so good at sitting people with their questions and doubts. I think too many churches are intimidated when people have questions and doubts. And I think, no, we should be the first place. Like, come, bring your doubts and questions. Like, we want to walk with you. Let's search together. Let's study together. Let's seek together. It's beautiful when we do that. So, so having doubts is not what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about someone who, like, I'm all for Jesus, now I'm anti-Jesus. Like, those are two different things. If you're kind of going, like, I'm struggling, I got questions or doubts, that's not what I'm talking about here. And so this is what we're, we're getting at. He's like, how is it possible that someone can go, I'm all in, I believe, 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 yes, yes, yes. Now I'm like anti. I, I'm not just drifting. I'm not just like, hey, I believed in high school, went to youth group, then in college, I parted a little bit, backslid. Like, he's not talking about, like, I, I'm just not living perfectly. For He's saying literally moving from, I follow him, I'm for him, now I'm anti him. I want to have nothing to do with him. And how, how does that happen? And I would argue and tell you, it doesn't happen overnight. No one believes from an all-in, I believe faith, to an all-out, I'm anti G. That doesn't happen overnight. There's usually a slow fade to that place. And what I propose and suggest is that at the root of that is the issue of there's a, there's a battle of deception there that causes you to move. Now, one of the things that I would say, too, when it comes to, like, doubts that you have, I actually think that it's the unspoken doubts that give way and begin to materialize over time. That's why I think it's important that if you have doubts, get into community, get into discipleship, have those around you to say this is it's the unspoken doubts that over time begin to build a case for me to say i'm going to turn now against jesus i'm going to turn now against my faith in him and, and what happens and this is why listen i want to help give us some tools because i believe in all my heart that god has asked me called me personally all pastors and leaders yes but but this is a, a burden i carry to prepare us for the deceiving times that we're in and I want to help you, especially like some of us, all ages. So I don't want to just isolate and say younger or older, because sometimes that's what we think. It's not true. Every age, 
the enemy can, can seduce us and pull us aside. Why do I say that? Because let's keep reading. Watch, watch what he says. He says, there'll be many who abandon their faith. Now watch this. It's not like they just walk away. And they will follow deceiving spirits, demonic spirits, evil spirits, and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Now, you might be asking, like, man, I don't know the last time I've sat under demonic teaching. Like, most of, like, Hollywood, Hollywood totally takes the demonic and the unseen role in spiritual warfare and confuses it, sensationalizes it, or even at times uh, dumbs it down to a point where we just kind of go, oh, that's ridiculous, that's stupid. Does that make sense? Like, we, we, Hollywood does that with different movies. So maybe some of you are like, man, I, I like, when I watch movies, are you talking like, like all the paranormal stuff? Are you talking about like all the horror flicks we watch? Because like, dude, Mike, it's just like, it's just like, you know, I want to go and get thrills and get kind of like, it's all like scary because then like she'll get closer to with me and like it's, it was actually a technique. Okay. <laughs> Bro, don't play that game. But that's kind of what the enemy wants to do. The enemy wants us to think he's absurd or, or like ridiculous. You know, the old quote, Satan's biggest lie is to convince the world he doesn't exist, right? And yet, at the same time, like, he's so good, and if I can even use the word good, that's probably not even the right way of saying that. There's no good in him. But he is so able to manifest as light, that's why people are so easily deceived. People don't walk in and go, yeah, you know, today I totally want to follow doctrine of demons. I had that on my day planner. In fact, I got to, you know, that's what I want to specialize. Nobody says that. And, and yet, at the same time, that's exactly what causes the slow fade to move from a believing faith to a leaving faith. In fact, let me just continue on. There's another place in 1 Timothy chapter 6. So scoot over there a couple more chapters. If you turn over to... 1 Timothy chapter 6, listen to what he says, verse 20. He says, Timothy, protect. Everybody say, protect. protect. He says, protect what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly, empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thereby have gone astray from the faith. So he uses the language again. Like, they, they, here he says right here is that they have these opposing languages and arguments, and it's called knowledge. And back then it was Gnosticism. I, I mentioned all that last week, but I do believe that we're in days where you put whatever ism you want to put on it, it, it is alive and well today. At the root of it and the core of it is a deception. And I believe that the core of the deception of the enemy is that he wants to masquerade as light to deceive us which is what we're going to get into in, in a moment. We'll unpack, like, what does that even look like? How, how does he do that? But this is why this is so critical. There's a, a philosopher that was back probably 30, 40, maybe even 50 years ago. He coined a phrase, and the phrase is interesting. The phrase is cut flower syndrome. Now, what is cut flower syndrome? Well, he would say it this way. Will Herberg says it like this. Cut flowers retain their original beauty and fragrance, but only so as long as they retain the vitality that they have drawn from their now severed roots. After that is exhausted, they wither and die. So I brought some flowers with me. I walked in this morning and somebody said, oh, are those for me? I'm like, oh, no, they're not. And I think I'm going to be in a lot of trouble today. Because I have one, and I, I'll figure out where they need to go. I know where they need to go. But point of it being, when you look at a flower, and we all have seen flowers before. When you take a flower that's growing on its stem in the garden, and you cut it, you sever it, how many of you know it looks beautiful still? That's the hope. I bought these yesterday. And I can already tell, because I, I purposely did not put these in water or use the little magic powder thing that comes in it to keep it alive. But this is only going to be beautiful for a matter of days. And then at some point, it's going to wither and die. Why? Because it is severed from the source of, that brings its nutrients in life. And so this idea of cut flower syndrome is used, it's actually a phrase that's going around in, in different conversations right now about our society and culture. 
Uh, they, they use it in the context that America has drifted from a Judeo-Christian world, that was our, our roots, and that now we are seeing the withering of a nation that's been severed from those value systems. Okay, now, you, we can debate that all day long, but you get the point. I want to apply it spiritually. Because here's the reality. We're told in the book of Jeremiah, blessed are those who trust in the Lord. Everybody say trust. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord. For they will be like a tree planted by the river whose roots go deep and are nourished. And that even in times of scorching heat, and, and we, can, we can define that metaphor as hard times and trials, the promise is that those who have deep roots in trust in Jesus, in God's word, in him, they will be connected to the source of life that even though they go through different hostile times of life, whatever that can mean for you personally, culturally, globally, that you will be able to, as the promise in Jeremiah, you will be able to still produce good fruit. How many of you want to produce good fruit in scorching, heart, scorching hot seasons? You do. But the way that that happens is you have to stay deeply rooted. How are you deeply rooted? By trusting. What does the enemy want to deceive you into believing? You can't trust God. If there's one thing you leave away today, the only thing that you need to hear, what's Satan's number one deceptic, deceptic tactic, deceiving tactic, is he wants you to not trust God anymore. Because you will never follow anyone you don't trust. Intimacy is defined by trust. If you don't have trust, you never have intimacy. So Satan wants everything to do. He wants to sever your trust in God. So you move from I believe in him, I trust in him, to I no longer trust in him, now I reject him. Does this make sense? You have to get this. I'm going to build on this all morning long. How important trust is. But where does trust come from? Trust comes from truth. This is why I call the combination of trust and truth, I call it truthing. Isn't that clever? You have to have a truthing faith. A truthing faith is what keeps you nourished. It keeps you rooted. That when deception comes along, the enemy's gonna get you to believe I can't trust him anymore. Why? Because I question. And especially in a culture, in a world, that's all about relativistic, it's all about me truth. Where you get to decide your truth. I get to decide my truth. Truth is whatever you want it to be anymore. What the enemy wants to do is get you to plant your roots in yourself. And when we put our roots in ourselves, we're not putting our roots in him or get us to put our roots in something else other than him. And as a result of that, many of us, we don't just have a leaving faith, we have a withering faith. And so I believe that one of the things that will help prevent a withering faith or a leaving faith is the power of discernment that we get, but it has to be rooted in the truth. Truth is super critical and important. That's why in Timothy 1, Timothy 2, he brings up doctrine and truth. What is doctrine? Maybe some of you haven't been to church, and that's okay, because I grew up going in church not even knowing what doctrine always meant. The word doctrine simply means this. It's the truth of God. It's the truth of who God is, and it's the truth from God. So it's truth about him, but it's also truth from him that shapes how I see the world. Because every single person here, you have what's called a worldview. A worldview is, is, imagine this, you're driving your car down the road, you have a windshield, that's your view. As you're looking at life and you're deciding what path to take, what's right, your moral decisions, how you understand reality, all of that comes from this thing called a worldview. What shapes your worldview is what you decide and where you are anchored in truth. And if you are anchored in something that's not of Jesus, not of God's word, then you have a non-biblical worldview. Does this make sense? As a result of that, it's easy to veer off, to get off course. So he talks in Timothy over and over again how important truth is, how important truth is, how important truth is, how important doctrine is. Now, I, I will say this too. When we get into this, it could get really, get really interesting. Um, Gary Brashears is a good friend of many of us. He's a professor at Western, dear friend, specializes in all kinds of great things, and he's just a dear friend. He's someone I personally consult with um, and just talk with him about things. He, is just, he's, he mentors so many pastors, um, but he has a great way of breaking this down that might help you. And there's four D words that he uses, and I'm gonna put them up here on the screen because this, this might help you navigate how do we have conversations with this idea of, of doctrine? What do we mean by like right teaching and truth? Because there's, there's things in the Bible that you and I might disagree on, or you might disagree with somebody else, and like, where, where does that fit 
with doctrine and truth, and what do we know is from the enemy what is not, what's just a different opinion, all of those things. Well, he would say it this way. We have what we call the, the essentials of the faith. What are the essentials? The essentials of the faith. These are things like we will die for this. And, and many believers for centuries did die for this. These are the things that Jesus is God, fully God, fully man, that Jesus came in the flesh, that Jesus went to the cross, died, that Jesus physically, literally rose again, conquered sin, conquered death, will come back again. There is one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three aspects, three attributes, but one God. These are examples, you'll fall, fall, find these in the Apostles' Creed. These are the things we die for. Like, there's no compromise on, on these things. And there's many more in there. I just don't have time to list all of them. Then you get to things that you actually say, hey, these are issues we're going to divide for. These are things that we're, we have passionate commitments to. There are things, like for me as a pastor, I have passionate commitments. What I'm preaching on today is a passionate commitment of mine. But it's okay to say, other churches, we're going to divide. Now, how many of you know that division can be a bad thing? The enemy wants to get in and divide. Absolutely. If you can get in, a house divided against itself cannot stand. So there's the bad part of division, but there's actually a healthy part of multiplication or expression where you can have churches that we agree on the essentials. We don't compromise those. Those are the things to die for. We, we, we don't, like that stuff, that we're not talking about that. But we are going to say, your church is focused on that. We're going to focus on that. And, and these are things that fit the passionate commitments. The letter C here is the idea of things we debate for, just areas of tension. The last one are just things that, they, they're not essential, but we can have discussions and we can kind of decide where you're at and we can be good together, but they're not, they're not critical ones. You have to decide where some of these issues fall for you. And I have to decide and we have to decide. And what I'm going to talk about today is something that I believe for me personally is I, I have to teach on this here it, because of, of what I feel a conviction about. And so that's why I, I put it in letter B over there, why this is important for me. I think the truth of God is really critical. I don't know how, about you, but I, I believe that. I believe it's so critical because if we allow any place for truth of God to be watered down or skewed by the enemy, it actually, it leads to collateral damage of people losing their faith. That's a big deal. And as a pastor, like I have a job you have as a, pe as a parent. I've said this before. You as a parent, your job is to prepare and protect your kids growing up. Is that, is that correct? Parents, you know that, right? Like your job is to prepare them for the world. So hopefully you're preparing your kids so that when they go off to high school and college, they're not getting their money stolen from, from a scammer. How many think that's a good idea? Or how, how many of you be like, you know what? When my kid goes off and they're on their own, I totally hope they get scammed. It would be so good for them. How many of you have that parenting theology? We're going to pray for you after the service. <laughs> Deliverance. I believe it's the same thing for us as pastors. How are we preparing and protecting both of those? You have to decide how that looks. But part of preparing is having the powers of discernment through the truth of the Holy Spirit, the truth of God's word, so in the front of my lens that as I'm navigating life, how am I making decisions? You know, there's so many complicated issues in our world today. And I really believe, and I'll get to this in a, in a moment too, I believe that we get so myopic, we miss actually the spirit behind these things. And, and do you have the tools, the power of discernment to be able to go, what am I seeing? Am I really seeing what's face value or really what's behind that? And, and that's what I want to help unpack some of that today. So go with me now to an, another verse. This is uh, in 1 Timothy 4. Go with me to 1 Timothy 4. Go with me to 1 Timothy 4. And while you're getting there, let me say it this way. Everybody says that this world is so illiterate when it comes to the Bible. Have you ever heard that? Anybody had that statement before? People say, man, we're so biblically illiterate. I actually think we're not biblically illiterate. I think we're biblically illiterate. If you look up what the word illiterate, illiterate means I can't read. Illiterate means I choose not to read. And I, I think like, at the end of the day, how many of you read the news? How many of you are reading sports stuff? How many of you are reading the highlights? How many of you are reading headlines on, on Twitter or formerly known as Twitter? How many of you, you, problem isn't not reading. The problem is what am I reading? What am I allowing to influence me? What am I allowing to shape my worldview? What am I allowing to help me make sense of what is true or not? It, it's actually not, we don't read, it's, it's the critical question is, what are you reading? And is, is God's word the primary source uh, able to discern and filter what's happening in the world? And, and the other thing that I just want to say, I want to put up here uh, something called normalcy bias. 
normalcy bias. Now, maybe you've never heard that phrase before. How many of you have ever like gone to the like a hiking trail and you see it says beware of bears? Y'all like okay, three of us. We three of us have totally done hiking. Great. Okay. How many of you have ever driven a car? Let's just start with that. And you, there we go. And you see a sign that says detour, detour, or bridge out. How many of you be like pay attention, right? How many of you know that, like, the people who put that there are probably trying to help us out? That you would avoid a car wreck. Avoid that, right? Normalcy bias is fascinating because I hear this all the time. You know, we had COVID came in four years ago, whatever it was, and, and I believe that COVID was the beginning of an intensification of deception personally. And, and I think what happened after COVID, I felt this way too. And I know many people say, man, I just want to get back to normal. 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 How many of you, we've all said that. So I want to get back to normal. Normalcy bias, by definition, means this. Normalcy bias or normality bias is a cognitive bias which leads people to disbelieve or minimize threat warnings. It means this. When someone says, hey, watch out. There's a bridge out. Don't go this way. Our brain wants to tune out the warning because we really crave to go on the same path that we've always done. That was normal for me. And so we want normal so bad. We do, and that's okay. Like, let's just admit it. We want things to be normal. So when someone says, hey, guess what? Things aren't normal. Things are deceiving these days. We actually choose to say, I can't deal with that. I don't want to deal with that. So I'm going to choose to turn off the warning sign. You all get it when like, the little, you're driving the car and the oil light comes on. How many of us ignore it? Right? It's the same thing. Like, that little thing's not bleeping. This thing can go forever. On empty. Whatever. Normalcy bias. And, and it, 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 it's a way the enemy keeps us from actually paying attention. And Paul said multiple times in here, watch out, pay attention. So here's what I, here's what I want to do. I'm going to take the time that I have, the last little bit, and I want to talk about how do we be compelling in a culture of deception. And I love the word compelling because the word compelling as a church, it means for you and me, it means that you are able to sit in, immersed in culture and society, but what you believe, what you say, and how you live your life, it's compelling. People actually look at it and they go, huh, I'm interested in what you're saying. I'm interested in your point of view. Like, that's fascinating. What are your thoughts on something? Like, my life, not just my words, but how I live my life, draws attention and curiosity and questions. It begs a compellingness. That's what it means to be compelling. So I'm going to give you a few, uh, like three or four ways that we can be compelling in a deceiving world. Number one is this, if you want to write it down. A compelling church is a compassionate church. A compelling church is a compassionate church. Now why in the world would I say compassion? When you think of compassion, you think coming alongside someone and helping them and being careful and gentle. That's a great word. How many of you know we're called to be compassionate? Good. This is a great test. This is like we're all doing okay on this one. We are called to be compassionate. But let me just kind of walk this out, and I'm going to say some things over the next little bit. Hang in here with me. Just, I might say some things that push you a little bit, but I want you just to hang in with me till the very end. Listen to what he says. 1 Timothy 4, verse 6. In light of all this, like, demonic teaching, deception, and lies, he says, if you point these things out to brothers and sisters, like, expose it. Don't pretend those things aren't happening. Talk about it. Like, bring these conversations into your church. Talk about them. He says, if you point these things out to your brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith. Notice he says, nourished on the truths of the faith and the good teaching that you have followed. Now, turn with me now to 2 Timothy 2. This is where we're gonna get. So he says, go with me to 2 Timothy 2. I know you're all like, Mike, just flip over there. He says it this way. Opponents. Ooh, that's a big word. Everybody say opponent. opponent. When you think of opponent, what does that mean? What's the, what's the word opponent mean? Someone who opposes, okay? It's pretty easy. They, they have a different view or an opposite view or an anti view. He says opponents must be beaten over the head with a club. <laughs> Wait, what translation are you reading? That's, that's my translation. What does he say? He says opponents must be, what's the word? Gently instructed. Notice he also doesn't say, don't miss this, he doesn't say opponents must be passively ignored. 
See, everybody's like, oh, yeah, yeah, give it to them, Mike. Tell them they can't be aggressive and angry. Okay, let me go after the passiveness, too. This is where everybody's like, man, you got all of us. I know. The Word does that to us. He says it right here. He says, listen, this is so good, though. Please, I want you to hear this. He says, in the hope. Everybody just say hope. What a good word. This is, I hope you feel some encouragement. He says, in the hope that God will grant them repentance. Repentance means I went from a believing faith to a leaving faith. Now I'm going to go from a leaving faith back to a believing faith. He says, in the hope. I, just, I want to speak hope over us right now. Because I, I knew in the last couple of weeks, me speaking on this, it was going to conjure up many people who have friends or family members, loved ones, that have gone from a believing faith to a leaving faith. I sit with families, individuals, young people, old, all the time, who weep and say, oh, they believed at one time and they've left. Maybe there's some of you here today, you're going, I'm kind of on my way back to a believing faith. We love that you're here. It's so awesome. We, we champion cheerily with you that you're making your steps back. We celebrate that with you. And I love that the word hope, I just want to speak hope over everyone in the room that you might have loved ones. And the hope is this, listen, the hope is not just that I'm right. Did you catch this? The hope is not that I'm just right. The hope is what? Their return. You catch that? That's the hope. And so why is that, listen, don't miss the context. The word gentle here, it means to be patiently, it means to be carefully, lovingly, but it also goes with instruct. Some of your translations say correct. See, we're not supposed to do this in the world today though, right? We're supposed to just like agree and affirm. You should never correct. But he says it right here, actually, no, we are called out of compassion. Not arrogance, but out of compassion. This is why people ask me, where'd you get that phrase, bold humility? It's from right here. The word bold humility means I am bold to speak correction and truth, but you do it in a posture of humility. So why? So we can see as many that have fallen away come back. And then he goes on to say this, grant them repentance so they can come back to the knowledge of the what? The truth, there's the word again, and that they will come to their senses. The word senses here is the word sobriety. It's the idea that, that they've been under the influence of the enemy, and now through the Spirit of God, through your gentle leading and correcting and communicating with them, that they will come back. And they'll come to their senses, escape. Now watch this. Escape from the trap of the devil, meaning that, that, that Satan has entrapped them, who has taken them captive to do his will. This is why, listen, don't, don't miss this too. The Bible says, take every thought captive. The Bible says that we actually demolish. Everybody say demolish. We demolish every pretense or every belief or every ideology, every theology that sets itself up against the truth of Jesus. The last time I read demolish does not sound very passive. It says that we demolish every teaching idea that is anti-Jesus and we take every thought captive and hold it to what? The truth of Jesus. And I've said this before. What you don't take captive will take captive of you. And this is what Paul's saying right here. He's like, let's gently, encouraging, lovely, be truth tellers with love and compassion. But this is why in our world right now, everybody wants to love everybody. Awesome, that's great. We're called to do that, and I hear this. I just want to love them. 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 I'm like, that's great. And then I hear people say, I, I, I'm telling everybody the gospel. I'm telling them that, that God loves them. Let me, let me say something. Telling people that God loves them is not the gospel. It's part of the gospel. The full gospel is God loves us, Romans 5, 8. He demonstrates his love to us that while we were sinners, he died for us. But Jesus still invites us to a thing called repentance. He doesn't impose on us. He invites us to have faith in him that when we repent and turn and we put our faith in him, not clean my life up, not be perfect, but by faith and faith alone, not by works, we turn, we acknowledge that I'm a sinner that needs a savior, that Jesus Jesus rose again to conquer sin and death so that those of us who put our faith in him could have new life. That's the gospel. So I, I just, I'm never gonna assume anymore that we even know the gospel anymore. I, I'm convinced in these days that there are believers and church leaders don't even believe in the gospel anymore. 
because we're so worried about it offending. I think we can be offensive, and the gospel can, but, but do we actually believe in the power of the truth anymore that the truth can be so compelling? Do I, do I believe that the gospel can stand on its own, that when it is shared, it can be so compelling that it captivates heart and the spirit of God can through his power, through us sharing, turn lives back to him? Do we believe in the compellingness of the gospel? Do we believe in the power of the gospel? Do we? Or we just believe more in the power of our love? This is why I've said this before, don't miss it. I think one of the deceiving things today is we are called to love God, right? First and greatest command ever, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I believe that what we've done, we've made love our God. We're called to make God our love. Does that make sense? And so if God is my love, he's the object of my love, then I want to serve him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so like just loving's great, but loving with truth is what we're called to do. And this is what rescues people. This is what helps return them back. So just loving them, yes, I understand you might want to compartmentalize that, but I want to encourage you, the loving thing's easy, the truthing thing is hard. I understand that. But it's where we need the Spirit of God to help us, to be compelling in that way. Let me just give a, another verse to you guys. Okay, so we're called to be compassionate. A compelling church is called to be a compassionate church. Number two, a compelling church is a courageous church. A compelling church needs to be a courageous church. Meaning that we need to be courageous and, and not be ashamed of the truth of God's word. Let me just read this to you. If you got your, we'll go into Timothy again. Listen to this. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of what? Word of truth. Don't be ashamed of that. Don't be ashamed of that. Hey, hey, church, guess what? This is me making an official announcement. Okay, you ready? Big announcement. Grace Chapel will never be ashamed of the truth of the gospel. Okay. I had a friend come up to me because I said that first service and like nobody applauded. <laughs> and then I said, let's do a, do a redo. And then everybody applauded. And a good friend of mine said, Mike, that was a powerful moment because he said, did you see how we all hesitated? And he said, for him, he goes, I feel with the opposition of friends that look at me now because I, I identify as a Christian, he says, am I really ashamed of the gospel? That even in church, I cannot celebrate it. And that hit me this morning when he shared. I was like, whoa, thank you for that. That, that meant so much. In between services, he shared that. I was like, wow. I'm not saying if we didn't share, don't hear that. We're ashamed. Don't, don't hear that. That's the last email I need is because we all didn't celebrate. I get that. You understand my point? Listen to what he says verse, in 2 Timothy 4. So scoot over with me again. We're going all over Timothy, but we're pulling out, we're siphoning out these ideas around truth and how important it is in days of deception. In 2 Timothy 4, he says this. He says, I give you charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Meaning like all times, be ready. And then he uses these words that we don't like. Correct. Rebuke. And encourage. Oh, we like that one. And then he goes, with great patience and careful instruction. And then he goes on, verse 3. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, their own truths, their own whatever, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to the myths. And I, I pray and hope that God would never use me, that I would be an accomplice to someone's leaving of faith. Because we wanted to teach what people wanted to hear, not what they really needed to know. Because it's the truth. Listen, and, I, and this is why I get this to you. Let me just say this. How many of you know, like, we live in such a polarized world? You know, you know, how many of you know that? It's so polarized. Like, everything's like, here, 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 here. We got Thanksgiving coming up. Come on. Many of us are like, oh, Thanksgiving, there's going to be people at the table. You know what I'm talking about. And it used to be like, hey, Thanksgiving, we're all getting together. And now it's like, Thanksgiving, oh my goodness. And you're like, I know the conversations, you're all like, can you make sure that so-and-so sits here and doesn't sit next to so-and-so? And can you make sure you text them ahead of time, don't bring that up? <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Here's something I've noticed, and I, I believe it's, I believe it's a, 
an insight from the Holy Spirit. Let me share it with you. You can get polarity fatigue. Everything's so polarized, 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 polarized. It's fatiguing. It is. It's okay to say that. It's exhausting. It's exa- Listen, there is a migration of pastors leaving the church, and the number one reason is because of the polarities of trying to pastor through tense seasons where it's this issue, and then the next one, and then the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Listen, we get it. I understand how the polarity is exhausting, but listen to me. This is something I feel like the Holy Spirit showed me. In our attempt to deal with polarity exhaustion, we want to settle for peace to the point that we say we just need a moderate view on things. If we can just meet in the middle, if we can just find moderate, I hear this all the time, we just need to be moderate, 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 moderate. We need to find moderate, 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 moderate. It's that word you say and it just loses meaning over time. Moderate, moderate, moderate. The last time I checked, Jesus never said, I am the way, the moderate, and the life. But I understand that, and this is where the enemy wants us so fatigued, church. We have to have the resilience to stand with the truth, even when it's fatiguing. We cannot compromise. There are some things that can be moderate, yes, but there's key things we cannot, and for the sake of what, some illusion of peace, some, some absence of conflict, may we never compromise on that. And I, I want to say it to strengthen you so that no matter where you're at in the world tonight and whatever's coming ahead of us, may we never compromise because we settle for some short-term peace instead of the peace, the king of peace and how we need to serve him. Does this make sense? We have to be courageous. We have to be bold and say things. It's, it's fascinating, too. I'm, I'm going to skip on because i got so much I can say on that. The next one is this. A compelling church is a contending church. Contend for something. That could be good. Like, I want to contend for something. What does that mean? Let me give you this one. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, it says this. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There's going to come a time. It's just whether it's personal, whether it's corporate, global, whatever. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Like, and that, that can come in waves and extremes. Everything from people look at you a weird way, don't want to associate with you. Could you call that persecution? Maybe at a personal level, yeah. To, to bigger, more, more, more intense ways of ramifications. But here's what he says, verse 13. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, continue. Everybody say continue. Continue, steadfast, perseverance. Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. See, this is, this is why for me, when I break this down, you can look at two narratives in the Bible. There's what we call like, like narratives throughout the Bible. You know what a narrative is, right? It's, it's a storyline. And when you look at the Bible, there are two main narratives. And this is where we get lost. I, I want to share with you, this is how I see the enemy working today. There are, are, are two main narratives you see in the Bible. The first narrative, the most important narrative, is that Jesus is king and Jesus wins. Jesus is good. Jesus is the, he's the, he's our hero. Jesus is the one who is the victor. He's the overcomer that no matter what we go through, Jesus wins. Jesus is good. Jesus is the hero of the story. That's the big meta narrative of the whole Bible. Are you with me so far? The, thank you for that. Yes. <laughs> Give him the glory. He is the hero. The second narrative, but not equal, but, but second narrative that you see from the beginning of the Bible all the way through is that Satan is doing everything to convince you that Jesus isn't the hero. Everything he does. How do I know that? Let me just give you, let's go down memory lane real quick. You start with Satan who's in heaven. He's lusting. He's craving for the throne of God. He's a created being. He's not God. He's he's under God. He's He's an angel, a created being. You have God who's God. Satan is not God. There's no, du- there's no like duality here. Some people think there's God and Satan. No, they're not even on the same plane. Level. Satan then in heaven wants God's throne, but he can't have it. He's not God. So he creates a rebellion and, and to overthrow that, God's like, well, hey, I'm God. You can't do that. He's evicted out of heaven. This is where we see the conversation with Satan in the garden with Adam and Eve. And in that moment, listen, Satan knew if he couldn't steal and overthrow God's throne in heaven, he would try to steal God's throne in human hearts. And so if he can do everything he can to deceive humanity into seeing and believing that Jesus, that God is the villain of the story, because isn't this true? You will never trust someone that you believe is evil. 
You will never trust or follow someone that you believe is wrong. And so what does Satan do? He wants to plant, so he does it with Adam and Eve in the garden, convinces them, who's God? That he would send you here in the garden, put this tree over here, and, and hold out on you. This is so unfair. This is so unfair. A lot of people leave their faith because, listen, not all theology is fair. My dad dying when I was 22 years of age, that's not fair, would you agree? And so if I take my fairness and project it onto God and say, I'm going to reject you because life isn't fair, then, then nothing's going to be, nothing's going to be rooted in truth. And so he convinces Adam and Eve, and then you see this all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the Old Testament. They rebelled, they rebelled, rebel, 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 come back, rebel, 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 because at the core of that, they didn't believe, they didn't trust that in the goodness of God, that God is the hero. They kept believing God's the villain. He's holding out on us. He's not for us. This is why Paul in Corinthians says this. He says, my fear, my concern for you is that you would fall into the same trap as Eve in the garden. And so Satan's whole goal, if you were to look at the Bible, the big, 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 what we call the macro narrative is that Jesus is the hero, but the other macro narrative is that Satan's trying to convince us that God is not good because you will never trust or follow a God that you believe is not good. Does it, just everybody with me so far? Okay, but, but here's where it gets really interesting. I've noticed a pattern in the last five years that I want to share this with you, and I, I believe this with a lot of conviction. You can look, I, ha, I think I have a chart up here. Do I have a chart? Yes. Just take a picture. I don't have time to get into all of it. You have the big narrative, which is God is the hero. You have the other narrative, God is the villain. And I started noticing a trend. And I noticed that in all these complex issues in culture, society, and the world, you can fill in the blank with whatever issue is at hand. Maybe for a while it was, it was race stuff and politics stuff and then it's gender and sexuality and, and then it's like geopolitical things. Here's what I have noticed. Everybody's getting into the micro-narrative and we're getting all into the complexity of this and we don't even see the spirit behind all these things. What Satan is doing is he's leveraging each of these topics where you can find some truth in that. Because how many of you know that Satan is really good at taking a little bit of truth and fabricating a whole lie around it? It's called outliers. You can take one little truth. He did this in, with, with Jesus in the, in the desert. He quoted and perverted and misquoted scripture. He used just enough truth, but then distorted it to convince Jesus that God wasn't worthy of his trust. Put God to the test. It's the same thing. Jesus, hey y'all, Jesus passed the test for us. Satan's scheming is the same thing. What Satan is doing, I've seen this narrative build over and over. It doesn't matter the issue. It doesn't matter the topic. And we get so myopic in it, and we get so complicated in it, and we don't have the discernment to sit back. And what Satan is doing through all these, he's weaving a thread that builds and it builds and it builds. And a society and culture is now being more convinced that God is the villain. It's played out. Had a conversation recently. There's parents in, in our church uh, a conversation maybe a couple months ago, maybe three months ago, students in different, and we have a lot of amazing teachers, don't hear this wrong, we have a lot of amazing teachers, but I'm hearing more consistently from parents, from students who are hearing directly from their teacher, saying words that Christians are haters, Christians are this, and Christians are this. And teens and kids are going, hmm, I don't know anymore. And that's what the enemy's doing. And you can count, like, I can just tell you like clockwork, whatever the cultural issue is, I can guarantee you that behind it is a spirit that's weaving a thread that through it all is building the case God is on trial and his goodness is on trial. And you have to have the ability to discern and navigate all those things to know that. When I was in high school, it was always the threat of going to, away to college with secularization that God wasn't real. And I had this kind of epiphany, I wanna share it with you. This is what I wrote down. We've moved from the lies of secularization, God is not real, to the lies of victimization, God is not good. That is, the, that is the permeating lie that you will see consistently, and as a result of that, we begin to go, yeah, you know what, he's not good, he's not good, he's not good. And Satan says that, it, that uh, the Bible says that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And his light is so attractive. And so somebody shared with me last week a great example. I have a couple that I'm gonna share as we close. On our back porch, we have a light. It's not this one, but it looks like this one. And we have one of those bug zapper lights. Anybody see one of the bug zapper lights? They're so awesome. It's great for Saturday night, sit on the back porch, just watch. You've all seen them, right? 
You see the bugs flying around, flying around, flying around. They see the light, and they're like, light. <laughs> and they come to the light, wham! <laughs> and we cheer it on. That was a good one. <laughs> and, and that's exactly what the Bible tells us, that Satan, he wants to look like light. In all these complex issues, Satan wants to reverse. He wants to distort. There's a saying that says, he who defines the terms wins the argument. And Satan's always distor- distorting. He's flipping the script. He's redefining evil. He's redefining good. As a result of that, the outcome through all of this is God becomes the villain. And then the more and more you and I, that we're not aware of that, we can actually be drawn to a counterfeit light thinking because Satan uses Bible terms, Bible words, and we're drawn to that, but then it leads to destruction. My son had another, which I think is a brilliant illustration of this. It's called the anglerfish for all Nemo fans. <laughs> Isn't that true? And, and the idea is that like, you can actually be attracted to this light and be like, oh, light! Wham! You're a meal. Devoured. This is exactly Satan's way, his demonic teaching is going to look so like Jesus. It's going to look so like Jesus. It's going to look like the values of Jesus. It's a different spirit behind it. And we have to be so discerning to go, I can handle these conversations, but I know the spirit behind them. I know that's actually not, you're using the Jesus words, but you're not using Jesus' spirit. There's something on that. Does this make sense? And it's interesting, I was talking with Brad Peterson with counseling, and he, he shared a phrase with me. It's called DARVO. Maybe you don't know what DARVO is. DARVO is what domestic violence abusers use to flip the script. DARVO is actually something that abusers in a relationship convince everybody that the actual villain, the abuser, is the victim. Satan is so good at doing exactly that. Satan is so good at gaslighting Jesus. This is what he does. But so here's the way I'm gonna end today, though. You and I, we carry the truth and we carry the light, and there's a world out there of darkness where the enemy is working. But guess who represents the light? You and I. What I think to be a compelling church in these days of deception is that we need to contend for the integrity, the beauty, and the truth of who Jesus is. How many believe that Jesus is not the villain, but Jesus is the hero? And I believe, listen, in a counter-narrative culture where the world is counter-narrative, that's not the narrative that we want. It's not the narrative that Jesus is good or a counterfeit Jesus. But what we can do in that kind of world, we can live the counter-narrative life. We can live in such a way when people look at how we live and how we engage with them, how we share truth and the way we live our life, that people will look at us and go, wait a minute, your, your life is different. The way that you live is, it's not what I read, it's not what I hear on social, it's not all those things, but the way that I engage with you and do life with you as a student, as a coworker, as a family member, you're so gracious and loving, and yet you're compelling with this truth that you carry, and I, I'm just drawn to that, and the Spirit of God can take that and use that. So we have to be people who stand for the true life and the light of Christ, but we do that in partnership with the Spirit, and watch how God can take us in a deceiving world that we ourselves can walk in the light, and then we help others walk in the light. May we be prepared for the days ahead to not just be aware of what's happening, but on a rescue mission to help as many people walk in the light of Christ. We know what the enemy is against. He's taken them captive. Can we be on a rescue mission together? Can we do that? Can we be the light? Can we walk in grace and gentleness with bold humility? There's a world that needs to hear the truth and they, and they need to hear it through you and the way the Spirit of God can orchestrate those conversations. But if you and I have a lifestyle that doesn't line up with Jesus, they'll never hear the truth. And so this is why we have to live a counter-narrative life and we have to bring counter-narrative truth. Let's stand together. I'm gonna leave the light right here just as we close in this closing song. Will y'all just put your hands out? This is a symbol of surrender and openness. believe that in these days that God so loves his bride, his church, that no matter what we go through, the trials, the pushbacks, the opposition,
believe that Jesus said, but my church is gonna prevail. And I believe he had a vision. And I believe that even in times like this, he's refining his bride, he's, he's purifying us. I believe that we're in, I think we're in a season, to be honest with you, when Jesus was done with lukewarm churches. I think that's the season we're in. I think Jesus has been done. He's done with lukewarm churches. Churches that we just try to compromise and we appease ourselves and it's all about us and our consumerism and all those things. And I think we're gonna see more distinction. And I pray that we would be on the right side of that distinction. That we would hold to the doctrine, the truths of God's word. Be the anchor of who we are. We are deeply rooted. We trust him because he is good. He is good. No matter the lies personally, no matter how many unanswered prayers I go through, no matter what classroom I sit in, no matter what headline I read that tells me that God is not good, I wanna believe the Spirit of God can give us a deeply rooted in faith. And out of that would nurture us and would blossom the fruit of God's Spirit. And as we are deeply rooted in His truth, trusting in His truth, that we would be the shade for those around us, that they could come and find their nourishment, find their hope in Christ. So I just want to pray that over us. Jesus is worthy of it. So Jesus, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. I pray that you would strengthen us today. Strengthen our roots. No matter what we're facing, no matter the temptation, I pray, Jesus, that we would stand firm before you. But give us your power to do that. May we be humble and bold. I pray that your fruit would be in abundance for us. So I pray, Spirit of God, fall fresh on us now. As we sing and as we glorify you, we lift your name, Jesus. May you fill us afresh. There will be the overflow of that light and life as we go this week. We praise you, Jesus. May we exalt you now as if we believe it with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind and all of our strength. We worship you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship, church.